All right, Brother Short, if you go, please go ahead, unmute yourself and lead us in an opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you so much for the day that you've given to us, for the countless blessings that we enjoy in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you've allowed us to come together for the purpose of worshiping you, praising you, dear God. And we pray that as we worship you, that we will worship you in spirit and in truth. For we know that your word clearly tells us that that's acceptable worship in your sight. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the men that will be leading, that they will lead in accordance with your word and that you will be with the speaker to bring to his remembrance the things that he's prepared to deliver unto us from your word. For it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray and give thanks. Amen.
Brother Ames, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Are you, are you seeing the screen, my presentation? We are not. How about now? Perfect. Okay. All right. So this is a time of year where people tend to travel a little bit or, or take trips. And we used to say, get out of the house, but we don't do that quite as much as we used to anymore. Um, but. I'm glad that uh, Eugene, when he prayed, he said that to help me remember, because that's going to fit in a little bit, is what I want you guys to focus on as well, too, in the lesson tonight. In 2 Peter chapter 1, there Peter says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, <coughs> just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So when you think back of what you just heard, who can remember the most important word that Peter was using throughout these verses. Reminding, bringing into remembrance. Peter says he wants to remind them and for them to be aware of certain truths that they already knew. And as long as he was in his tent, his earthly dwelling, he would be reminding them again of these truths. And he said that after he's gone, he's making sure that they always have a reminder of these truths so that they would be able to remember them. He says in chapter three, he says, beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder that you may be mindful of the things which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. He says he wants them to remember. He wants them to remember the words of the holy prophets, the Old Testament. He wants them to remember the commandments of the apostles, the New Testament scriptures, which were being written. And he wants them to remember that all of these are the commandments of Jesus and the commandments of God. Paul used a very similar technique in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says that he had already written them once before in another letter, telling them not to keep company with fornicators. And then he goes on to tell them again, not to keep company with fornicators. Sometimes we need to be told the same thing over and over again even of the most simple truths, to bring them into remembrance, to keep us strong in the faith. So what I'm going to tell you tonight is nothing that you haven't already heard, but what I'm trying to do is to bring things to remembrance so that we can all be strong in the faith. I'd like to look in Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, this is a parable that we're all familiar with. This is something we all know. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but he endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. 
Now he who received among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it and who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. This is a very familiar parable, right? That there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from this. A lot of things are very obvious when you look at this. For example, who can look at this and identify that there are four kinds of soil, right? You can look at this and that's fairly obvious. Um, but what's also interesting is out of those that received the word, all but one of them fell away. And that's not so obvious when you look at this. And we don't like to look at it that way. Right? We want to think that everyone who obeys the gospel, that they'll continue to be faithful forever. But that's not the case. Right? We can hold Bible classes to try to help Christians grow. But no matter what, there are still going to be people that are going to fall by the wayside. And Jesus warned this was going to happen, and he even gives some of the reasons of why people fall away. He said that there are those who are snatched away because they have a lack of understanding. Right? They, they didn't learn. He says um, they stumble because they're not strengthened in their faith enough to stand up when troubles and persecutions arise. The final reason he also gives is that they just get caught up. They get entangled in the cares of this world and in trusting in riches. And they often try to make excuses for their behavior, right? That God doesn't care about the small things, right? As long as we love God and we're trying to be good, that's going to be good enough. And if we occasionally tell a white lie or we laugh at a dirty joke or we prioritize things over going to worship service, those are just the details. And as long as we love God and, and we, we have a love for him, well, he's not going to worry about the small stuff. Right? Paul expressed similar concerns of those who fell away for these very same reasons throughout his epistles. In 1 Timothy, he says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. They were snatched away because they had a lack of understanding. That's what Jesus said would happen. Not only have they fallen away, but they have caused others to fall away also. He says in chapter 6, he says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and it has pierced them through with many sorrows. They got caught up in the cares of the world. The concerns and the cares to manage all the stuff we have to manage. Right? Worldliness is what we think about. It's a this world view. Things distract us from what we should be focused on. Being consumed by living our lives, careers, sports, families, recreation, of this world view of what we're all about. And they become unfruitful as they focus on the deceitfulness of riches and the love of money, thinking that riches is going to have, bring them happiness, but instead all it's done is strip them of the joy that they once had, right? Leaving behind an emptiness in their life because they know that they're separated from God. He also says to shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they've overthrown the faith of some. Here's examples. He's calling out some people who were children of God, baptized, obedient, and now they're teaching false things about the re resurrection, saying that it has already happened. 
And now not only have they strayed from the faith, but they're overtaking the faith of others also. In Revelations chapter two, talks about Jezebel and how she had convinced the saints that it was all right not to worry about the details, that they could even commit fornication, right? Once we're free in Christ, we're free in Christ. She convinced them that these were just the details. As long as you love God, you don't have to worry about the details. Now her and those she led astray were in danger of judgment. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul said, God forbid. The saddest thing we can really talk about is Christians falling away or stepping back or stumbling, right? But I would be surprised if you actually looked and were able to figure it out. In the area where all of us as, as, as members live, the surrounding area, if you actually were able to look you would, could probably find there's as many or more people that were once Christians at one time and aren't anymore, as there are people that are actually attending congregations. And this is what happens. Um, you look, right, young people, right? Some of them are going to fall away in all likelihood. Even some of the young people we have, if you look, right, that's the danger that we see. And it's a terrible thought to think about. People once faithful to the Lord with the zeal for doing what's right. And at some point, that enthusiasm is going to go down. They'll begin to fall away, sometimes gradually, sometimes quickly. Well, why do people saw, fall away? Well, we saw in Matthew 13, sometimes it's entanglement with the world. Other times, it's simply the difficulties of life. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he has departed for Thessalonica. Now, this verse doesn't say that Demas abandoned the Lord. What it says was, he was one of many that Paul has identified that has abandoned Paul. Um, he was the only one, however, that Paul gives a reason for. And the reason he says was he loved this present world. Um, he loved life. He loved being alive. Paul had the sentence of death on him as he was sitting in prison and he was prepared to die. And had Demas stayed, he probably would have faced the same sentence. And that is why the scripture says that Demas abandoned Paul. So even if Demas was not a total apostate, right, even if he had not abandoned Lord, he still has the same problems that many of us have, and that is we love this present world. We love this life. We love being alive. Many young people, right, they don't want to date Christians because they're too square. They're too different, right? They're different from everyone else. They want to be drawn, enticed by the world, right? That's one of the things we saw as we've been studying through Samuel, right? We want to be like the people who are around us, um, right? I've never been enticed to gamble. Um, I'm not a big gambler because I can look at the odds and I realize the risk is too high, right? I know when odds are not in my favor, favor. but there's a lot of people that are gambling that God doesn't care about the details, right? That he doesn't care about the little stuff. And as long as they attend worship services weekly, um, then as long as they love him, right? It's, it's going to be okay. They're going to be taken care of. See, and I'm betting it makes a difference. And if they're right, I still win. But if they're wrong, they lose. And that's what we have to think about. Well, how do we stop people from falling away? And one of the things ultimately we realize is we can't. The only one that can stop Brad from falling away from the Lord is Brad. Jen can't do it, right? She can give him reminders. She can nudge him in his life. But the only one who can ultimately make that decision, whether or not he's going to follow the Lord, 
is that decision is up to Brad and no one else. And that's a decision he has to make. And that's a decision that Eugene has to make. It's a decision that I have to make. It's a decision all of us have to make. What are we going to be faithful to? Where are we going to put our priorities? So what I can do is I can bring to your remembrance certain truths, things that you already know, things that you're already established in, and bring these into remembrance that hopefully they help to make you strong in the faith, which is why Peter said he was writing these epistles to them. So what I want to look at is, I kind of want to use this verse, um, Numbers 21, verse 11. And I'm going to be very honest with you. I am very much using this verse in a way that it was not originally meant. Um, what I'm talking about from this verse is not what this verse is talking about. But there's three things I want to point out from here that I want to use as an outline. In Numbers 21, verse 11, it says that they journeyed from Abath and encamped at Ayibaran in the wilderness, which is before Moab, toward the sun rising. Now, one of the things we can see is that there's three points in here. One is they journeyed. The other is they journeyed in the wilderness and that they were headed toward the sun rising. And what I want to talk about is really, this is what our life is all about. Uh, this is exactly what our life is about. So the first one is our life is a journey. In Genesis chapter 47, Jacob is responding to Pharaoh when he comes to Egypt. And he's explaining to him what his life was all about. So it says in verse 8 that Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. I don't know about you, but if I live to be 130 years old, I don't know that I would refer to them as few. Right? I'm in my 50s now. I can't even pretend I'm middle-aged. Um, right? Even 45 is not middle-aged. I mean, how many 90, 100-year-old people do you see walking around? Right? Probably somewhere in the 40s is middle-aged, and I certainly have now less days ahead of me than I do behind me. Um, so now Jacob had lived 130 years and he said that they were few. And they were few compared to Abraham, Noah, Methuselah, Adam, right? Those that had lived before them, they was few compared to them. But he also says that his days were evil. I mean, how many of us have prospered the way that Jacob did? I mean, he lived a pretty good life. And he was going to Egypt as his family was being taken care of by God, but he still said his days were evil. But what's not important is the length of his life or the quality of his life, but that he recognized his life was a pilgrimage. And he uses that term twice, right? What is our life, right? It's just a passing through. Our life is just a journey, right? We sing that song, here we are, but straining pilgrims. And that's lot, lots of times we don't sing it the way that the author actually meant, right? We say, here we are, but straining pilgrims. And that's not what the author intended. What he said was here, we are, but straining pilgrims. It was not, we're not, we don't put the emphasis on the right syllable lots of times. The song is emphasizing this life is temporary. We don't belong here. We're just on a journey. It's not here we are, but here. Here we are, but straying pilgrims. In 1 Peter 1, it says that if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, 
pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. He says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Right? Peter says, this is a pilgrimage. Right? This life, it's a sojourning. It's a temporary stay. And that's one of the hardest concepts for us to remember at times. Right? We look around and everything seems so permanent. But what we have to realize is this world is not our home. Right Here, we're just pilgrims. Our minds should be focused on heaven. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to repair a place for you. And if I go to repair a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. You don't belong here. This is not where you should be. Jesus wants to receive you to him so that where he is, we can be there. But we tend to think that this life is what it's all about. And a lot of the time, we don't think that this is just a journey, but that this is the end. What we need to always keep fresh in our mind is the end is on the other side. And Peter said he was getting ready to put off this earthly tent. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Paul had been beaten, stoned, whipped, in prison, faced death many times, but he could say all of these things were just light afflictions because they just lasted for a fleeting moment. And he knew someday, right, this was all going to be over and he would enter heaven forever, eternal glory. The second point is, not only are we on a journey, but our journey is in a wilderness. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, there Paul says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Right? Paul was saying, we had the sentence of death, right? We were expecting to die when we were in that theater and the crowds were rioting, we were expecting to die. Um, my aunt, I had an aunt who died at a relatively young age because of cancer. Um, she was really only about 15 years older than me. Um, she was in her early 40s and she was diagnosed with cancer and given less than a year to live. Um, she had married her high school sweetheart, actually got married her senior year of school. And then they had three children who were all in their early 20s when she passed away. And my mother went to live with her for the last six to eight months of her life um, to help take care of her. So, and, and towards the end, you could see the effects that it was taking on her body. Um, and I used to go out there, usually I try to go out there every week, um, gave me a chance to see my mother um, who lived in Indiana, gave me a, a chance to see my aunt and spend times with all of them. Um, and she told my mother one time when I was out there and I was there to hear it, that if she knew her family would be faithful, that if she knew that they would all stay faithful, that she was ready to go. She had nothing left to hang on to, but she was concerned about them, right? Her focus was on heaven, right? She was ready. She was done. She knew she had the sentence of death on her and she could face it with joy. But the one thing that was holding her back was concerns for the loved ones that she was leaving behind. And after she died, her husband, who actually was an elder, wound up marrying someone who wasn't a scriptural, wasn't divorced with a scriptural divorce. And at least two of the three children fell away. As much as she longed to go to heaven and leave this world behind, she worried about those who would left behind and what would happen to them on their journey. 
In Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Right, as Paul was sitting in prison, awaiting sentencing, he longed for his pilgrimage to end so that he would be able to go and be with Jesus, but his heart ached as he worried about those that he was leaving behind. Would they be safe on their journey as well? He says in chapter two, he says, that I trust in Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. As Paul writes about Timothy in, in his Philippian letter, he says he's the only other person he can think of that is as like-minded as him in their care and concern for other saints, right? There are plenty of people that, that, that were faithful to the Lord, but they cared about themselves. Paul and Timothy were people who were concerned about others. And the people they saw around them, he saw that they were struggling in the wilderness. And even though Paul wanted to leave, he was concerned because he saw how perilous things were for them. He says in 2 Corinthians, um, he says that he'd been in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness and the sea, and in perils even among false brethren. Right? Nowhere else in the Bible is greater praise given to faithful saints. But do you know who gets the sharpest words of condemnation? False brethren. And he says there's false brethren out there. It's a wilderness. It's a dangerous place. He says he was in weariness and toil in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings, in cold and nakedness. But above all of those things, what afflicted him daily was his deep concern for all of the churches. Right? And we can see a lot of good being done, but there's also a lot to be concerned about. Right? We have young people attending classes, worship, we have members um, attending studies, even on weekends, right, on, on Saturdays, uh, all ch chances to learn, right? They have a love of God. They have a love for each other, and we can be encouraged by that. But as I pointed out before, younger people, older people, they struggle in the wilderness, right? A lack of understanding, bad decision making, getting caught up in cares of the world, and not everyone is going to make it. It's a wilderness, it's perilous. And that's what Paul was concerned about, that people focused on that. So the final point, right? We're on a journey and we're journeying through a wilderness, but we are headed towards the sun rising. In Colossians chapter three, it says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, setting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on this earth. So I'm going to make a little play on words. I already said I'm using this verse in a way that wasn't really intended, right? Um, so what is heaven about? What is this journey really about? It's all about the sun rising, right? Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. And where is Jesus right now? Well, Paul told us he's sitting at the right hand of God. Peter confirmed that on the very first sermon in Acts chapter 2. Jesus was sitting at the right hand of God. Now, there are times we see, right, with Stephen, 
when he was being stoned and facing persecution, he looked up and he saw him standing at the right hand of God, looking down at the persecution that was taking place and waiting to receive Stephen. So whether he's looking at us in pleasure or he's standing up in distress, he is still the risen Savior, the risen Son, sitting at the right hand of God. And we need to have a relationship with him. We need to go to him in prayer. We need to have daily communication with him. And we don't always have that. We don't always make the time for that because we're not focusing on the sun rising. Instead, we're focusing on shadows. We're focusing on the shadows of this life. Frank Lloyd Wright was a famous and accomplished architect. He had designed many famous structures that are in this area that you can go see. And he was once asked, what was the favorite project that he had ever worked on? What one single project brought him the most satisfaction? He was in his 70s at the time, a lifetime of engineering accomplishments. And, and the question was, what was the one single project that occupied his mind that he focused on and spent the most time thinking about? And do you know what his answer was? The next one, right? The next one, what was always on his mind? The next one, what was the one thing that he couldn't stop thinking about? The next one, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, setting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. We're on a journey. What is our most important destination? The next one. Right? This was a lesson, as Peter said, to stir up your minds, to help you remember truths that you already knew, that this is not our home, that we're just on a journey, but we're going through a wilderness, and it's not an easy journey, and there are a lot of perils, a lot of things to snatch us away or to make us stumble, but we can endure it because we know it's just for a short time and we can have hope. And as we head towards the sun rising, setting at the right hand of God, ready to receive the ones who were successful on their journey. And this journey starts with baptism. Baptism, we can receive that forgiveness of sins. We can be united, we can be in Christ, but we still have to go through that journey. Right? And maybe we stumbled. Maybe we've had problems along the way. We haven't had our, we weren't focused on the sun rising. Right? Reach out to the elders, have them pray for you, talk to other members, right? Spend time with God, spend time with this word, spend time in prayer. Think about these things. Nothing new I've taught you, just trying to get you to remember, right? What's important and the most important place that we're headed. The most important destination we can look for and go to is the next one. Think about all these things as we go to, as we sing a song of encouragement. It looks like Steve is the only one that has audio. Yeah, I just chatted. 
but I don't know. They may be able to hear us. So uh, no, not really. I really want to get sick of all of this words. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear anything. <laughs> but that's okay. This happened last week, didn't it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Does it look just to you or is it just me? What happened? I don't know. Yeah. I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted. Okay, Kim. Okay. We can hear you fine, hon. We cannot hear any anything else from the church. Can't hear you. Hopefully you can hear through the cell phone now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. Is Watch it out. We can hear you just fine. Loud and clear. Okay. So give me one more second. I'm just going <clears> to. <throat> so what we're going to do is, well, we're going to skip the song. And what we're going to do instead is put you right there so you can hear. <laughs> um, okay. So apologize. I don't. I don't know why that keeps on happening. Uh, Steve, I can see you. Give me one more thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Okay, good. Um, well, unfortunately, I, I, I'm glad it happened now. I'm glad we were able to get to this sermon. Very grateful. Wonderful sermon. But uh, we are at the point of the night that we uh, have the opportunity for those who have not had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Cup. Um, will you be doing any closing comments tonight? Or do you, okay, then I will go ahead uh, and I'll take the uh, the Lord's Supper. Um, we are uh, we have an opportunity every first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. What we heard tonight was about remembering. You know, our country is going through a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of trouble to strike, and I'm actually reminded about Matthew 17 when it comes to our country going through struggles with Christ, simply because this country has, has enjoyed relatively 
incredible prosperity mm -hmm. on the whole. There's a reason why there was an American dream. There's a reason why Brother Ramosetti and his family wanted to come here for that American dream. But what ends up happening is, is we put so forth so much emphasis again on what Brother Ames was speaking about, about the world and things and obtaining dreams, yada, yada, yada. And we're forgetting about the thing that matters the most. And it's our God. We forget to remember mm -hmm. who we have all these blessings from, including the blessing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And looking at why I'm remembered about Matthew 17, is if you call, Christ appeared with two other people, Moses and Elijah. And when offered to make a, 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 a tabernacle, or not a tabernacle, um, a, um, a, yeah, yeah, a tabernacle for all three of them, the other two disappeared. Because the focus has to be on Christ. We have to remember why we have our salvation, that this world is not our home, as we sang earlier, that we have a life after this, which that's where the matter and the care should be. And we have to remember why we have that life after this life. Because we have a, a God who loved us so much that he sent us his son. We have our salvation through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ having born on the cross. We have to remember regularly and that's why god gave us that command to remember that sacrifice that was necessary so we would have the life after this so as we go to our god in prayer for the um for the bread representing his body remember that great sacrifice that it took let's go to our heavenly father our god on high our father in heaven the one who holds our life in his hands that allowed us to wake up this morning and take breath in our lungs, the one who sent his only son to die for us. We are grateful, dear Lord, for the command that you gave us to remember this feast, this memorial feast, partaking of the bread which we bless that represents Jesus' body that he bore on the cross. Dear Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to remember each individually. It's our sins that nailed him to that cross. But it's your love that allowed him to die on that cross for us, Heavenly Father. Your love for us that you gave us an opportunity in a way to come back to you, to be with you one day in heaven. The obedience to the gospel would not be possible without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we are grateful, dear Lord, for this opportunity. We say thank you, Heavenly Father, for your son, Jesus Christ, as we partake of this bread. In his name, we give these thanks. Amen. Something that has been lost because of Zoom, because of the pandemic, and, and not having the time to pass out the, the trays, having the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, is that time to reflect. You know, I, I hope we have tried to remember and have more opportunity and time to reflect during the Lord's Supper, because it is equally important as the worship service and the sermon, it's equally important to the song singing. It's so important and often we don't do it enough justice in the time that we devote to it. So as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer for the fruit of the vine, remember the time that it would take to reflect on what it means to us. Let us pray. Our righteous Redeemer, Heavenly Father, the one who is sovereign over all things, dear Lord, we bless this fruit of the vine, an emblem representing your son's blood who was shed on the cross. Our God, Sometimes we just can't fathom and understand and comprehend the love that you have for us. So great, dear Lord, that the one who did not sin took on all of the sins of the world, past, present, and future. And we are grateful, Heavenly Father, for our sins to be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. So dear Lord, again, we bless us through the vine as we partake of it in remembrance 
of your Son, our Savior. In his name, amen. That's it. And that, that does conclude the Lord's Supper, and we also have the opportunity, as we do in the, in the morning, to have an offering to give back to our God. You know, uh, we often forget that we are so richly blessed that even the offering that we give back, yes, of course, it's to help keep these doors open, it's to help bring the message to the world, so many different opportunities. It's also an opportunity for benevolence. We are so richly blessed in this country to be able to have this building to worship in, free from the elements as it's going to get hotter out, wonderful air conditioning system. You know, we are richly blessed. And a, a, a good, healthy portion of the offering that's given back, we have opportunities to give back to the community, to those who are in need, and those who need a helping hand. It's, it's the fact that we do not love money that gives us an opportunity. It's the fact that our God blesses us and challenges us. We know we can't outgive our God. So I'm gonna say a quick off, uh, um, prayer for the offering. Heavenly Father, such a rich fountain of blessings you are. Dear Lord, we know that you bless the saints and the sinner alike with the sunshine and the rain and Again, the breath in our lungs. Dear Lord, we have an opportunity to give back to you. As Brother Johnson mentioned this morning, around the Lord's table, following the Lord's table, the time of offering, not just in monetary value opportunity, but in opportunities of giving up of our time, of sacrificially giving up our time, of putting other people's needs before us, Heavenly Father, whether again that be in the form of money or in the form of putting other people first before us in any walk of life, part of our walk of life. So thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to give back to you, our God, who has richly blessed us so. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and leave us up here for a, a speaker or a microphone. <coughs> Brother Ramasetti is coming up to close us out. We want to appreciate Brother Ames for bringing the sermon this evening. Um, he gave us a uh, nice scripture references. And uh, certainly it is uh, the reminder, right? Uh, if you look at the, the entire the Bible that is recorded for us, provides something to us in our daily lives. It is the reminder that we are God's children that we are under his providence and that we are to learn from what had happened in the past. And uh, as, as uh, Peter records here in the second episode, as he's written in the first as well, stirring up the pure mind by way of reminder. The very fact that we meet here is to remind ourselves that we are brethren. We are under his surveillance, under his providence. And uh, yes, we live in a world when rather talked about Jezebel, right? There's so many um, false teachers that we be very we should be very careful of, and uh, the and the things that we invite ourselves that we fall in that. So it is a constant reminder, the wonderful opportunity for us that we meet here in the Lord's day on the Lord's day morning and evening. And Brother Ames, thank you for those wonderful reminders from the scripture references. Uh, yes, we do remind ourselves every time that we gather. Not only that we gather, we, remind, we should remind ourselves within our family every day of our lives. All right, we're so blessed uh, to have a nice day. So blessed to be back again here in the Lord's presence. And uh, certainly it is uh, a good time. And uh, quoting the scripture again from Matthew, 
wherever there are two or more or three joined in my name, I'm in their midst. These are the words of Jesus Christ. So mm -hmm. uh, we pray that our services this evening has been pleasing uh, his sight. All right, any announcements? Uh, the packets are there on the table for the second and third lessons of Search for Truth and also Wednesday night Bible studies, um, the printed material. And please, uh, uh, you may pick up at your convenience. If not, um, we will we'll try our best to get it out to you uh, by way of uh, dropping them at your door uh, if you're nearby or mailing them to you. Tonight we have a uh, that we have uh, uh, Brother Short uh, closing us, Philip Short. Um, yeah. let's, let's close this evening. Um, please bow your heads so we can dismiss. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we, ha we have been richly blessed today and especially, Heavenly Father, the second service, because we've been reminded of some things that are so very important to all of us, Heavenly Father. And dear God, when I look on the screen and I see my brothers and sisters in Christ, so many of us have the same thought in our mind that Brother Ames has in her mind. And that's the fact of the well-being of our families. Heavenly Father, we want our spouses and our children, all of our loved ones, to make it home. That care that was expressed by the Apostle Paul, also by Peter. And the Heavenly Father, I've heard it repeated so many times by my brothers and sisters in Christ who have become close to their time to leave this world as they care for their family members. Heavenly Father, I've heard my brothers and sisters ask for prayers for the sake of their children, their grown children, Heavenly Father, who are not currently walking with you. But we pray, Heavenly Father, that while they're alive, that you will cause them to see again and to realize the danger that they are in and to run home as fast as possible, to hide under the wings of your son, Jesus Christ, to be nurtured again, Heavenly Father, and to love being in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we're also reminded of what your son said in Matthew 7 about the way towards destruction is broad and wide and many go that way. We're reminded, dear God, that you are not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yet we know, Heavenly Father, many will not make it through this wilderness. Help us to see this as a journey, as Brother Ames pointed out tonight. Because we know, Heavenly Father, we are in this world, but not of this world. This world is not our home. Help us not to get caught up in it, dear God, and to lose out on the thing that we want more than anything. But Heavenly Father, those same feelings that your servants, Peter and Paul, had, we have the same feelings, Heavenly Father, for the sake of others who are either teetering right now who don't walk with you at all. Please, Heavenly Father, we pray for them, and we pray that you help us to faithfully journey. Help us to realize the value of what's been given us, given to us, that caused Jesus, his life, to give to us. Heavenly Father, we pray that our worship tonight has been acceptable in your sight because of our great thanksgiving towards you, Heavenly Father, and your Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our desire, Heavenly Father, is to continually please you. And we thank you. 
In Jesus' holy name, amen. Brother Gene. Brother Eugene. Yes. That uh, your lesson this morning was fantastic. 